Hello and welcome to Dateline London, the murder of the U.S. ambassador to Libya. What should President Obama do about Iran and might Israel do something he doesn't want? Plus the U.S. elections and another week, another dodgy photograph of a member of the royal family. My guests today are Saul Zadka of Al London, Nabila Ramdani, who's a French Algerian writer, Janet Daly of the Sunday Telegraph and Jeff McAllister, who's an American writer and commentator. Well, you might think that the people of Libya, and in particular the people of Benghazi, should show a degree of goodwill towards the United States for America's part in getting rid of Gaddafi and helping save many Benghazi citizens from Gaddafi's troops. But whoever murdered the U.S. ambassador this week had something other than gratitude on their minds. What is going on in Libya? And with anti-American demonstrations in many Muslim countries, how big a setback is this for President Obama? Uh, beginning with you, Nabila, I mean, you were always very cautious about this rebellion in the first place. I mean, uh, uh, no tears shed for Gaddafi, but what would replace it was something that you talked about on this program for a long time. So what have we got now in Libya? Well, I suppose uh, what we have is what uh, we could call a, a blowback, effectively, you know, when you arm uh, people to fight a common enemy, and then these very people that you've helped turn against you. And that's exactly what we've seen in, in Afghanistan with the Taliban, for example. And there's no doubt that the huge support of the Americans was crucial, not only to protect civilian lives in Libya, but also to topple Gaddafi. And uh, the people who benefited from that are, are most definitely uh, armed groups, uh, jihadi militants, who were driving the revolutions and who were the ones who uh, ultimately uh, murdered uh, Gaddafi. Uh, and so, uh, of course, the Americans uh, would see that as a form of ingratitude. And uh, the grim irony, perhaps, is that uh, Chris Stevens, the former ambassador to Libya who was murdered, uh, was hugely supportive of military intervention at a time when the U.S. were still hesitant about whether or not to intervene uh, militarily. But we live in a world of real politic, it's self-interested pragmatism, and the jihadi militants now, uh, you know, uh, see that it's time to um, perhaps exploit a political vacuum and indeed an unstable situation. Do you, but do you, do you see links with uh, this uh, film, uh, or whatever it is, on YouTube, with the video on YouTube, or which... Uh, uh, portrays uh, the Prophet Muhammad in a, a terrible way and so on. Do you think there's a link with that? Or would this be something that was going to happen anyway because there are people who just hate the Americans? I mean, it seems uh, certain that uh, Chris Stevens died at, and indeed uh, three other members of, of his staff died at the hands of jihadi militants, not at the hands of uh, an, a mob that was offended by a blasphemous uh, film. Uh, and everything points towards that. Uh, it's no coincidence that the murder happened on the anniversary of the 9-11 attacks against the US. 24 hours before the murder, you heard the number one of Al-Qaeda calling for uh, to avenge the death of his second uh, uh, in, uh, in command. Yeah. Uh, who happened to be a Libyan. Uh, so there's no coincidence. And the ferocity and the clear coordination behind the attack, uh, everything seems to indicate, and the history, the track record of uh, a, a particularly fer ferocious Islamic group called Ansar al-Sharia, al who had been carrying out executions in Benghazi in particular, uh, all of that points towards, you know, a, a very clear murder. The, the thing that really surprised me, and I suspect surprised you, that's all, was how little security he had. I mean, this is, a, this is still a very unstable area. He must have known the risks. And uh, was it surprising that he put himself at such risk? Absolutely. And this happened in Benghazi, shocking of all, the cradle of the Libyan revolution that has been supported uh, by the Americans, although from the back seat. But certainly it were the Americans and the Europeans who brought about uh, this revolution to be so successful. And the fact that the Libyans did not show any gratitude just shows that the, the, the country, uh, in the light of what was happening after the revolution, is still very chaotic. So many armed militias are roaming free in the country, and the current government does not do anything about it. We all know where the, this uh, group is, is, is based. They have their own camp. Nobody is really uh, is making any attempt to disarm them. And at the same time, the Americans, naive as they used to be in the Middle East, have uh, deprived him, the ambassador, of any decent security. And that's why his killing was so much possible. Janet? Yeah, the, the idea that the film provoked some spontaneous protest which ended in the murder is absolutely absurd. I mean, the protesters don't usually have rocket launchers, uh, you know, in a spontaneous demonstration. This was clearly a coordinated attack, al-Qaeda, if you like, in the Felucis sense, that had been planned to coincide with 9-11 and that was aiming for particular victims whom they knew to be on the spot when they might not have been. It was a consulate, in fact, not an embassy. Um, so the, the, the interesting question about this, though, is why haven't 
the consequences of this for Obama's foreign policy been discussed in this last week? I mean, there was a phenomenally successful spin operation by the White House to see to it that the entire debate was conducted around Romney's gaffe, as it was called. That's all they've been talking about on the American media for the last week, when in fact, what has to be asked is what has happened to the new beginning that Obama promised in his Cairo speech about conciliation with the Muslim world? Clearly, the bottom has fallen out of his foreign policy, and this is a matter that needs to be discussed. Is, is, this, is this a Jimmy Carter moment for him, I suppose, is the way of summing it up? As much as I don't like to disagree with Janet, I have to disagree with this. <laughs> I did oh, go ahead. Yes, I, uh, I mean, this is not a Jimmy Carter moment. This is not the seizure of the embassy in 444 days. No, no, but well, I had no, to, I did, to try and the, stoke I, I, it up a bit. Answer the question. Um, you know, the idea that Obama promised uh, peace and wonderfulness would break out in the Middle East because of what he did and that uh, this one incident or the demonstrations in Cairo or elsewhere uh, somehow disprove the Obama hypothesis. It's just not, it's just not possible. No rational or intelligent person who understands the history of the Middle East can expect sure. he can wave a wand and make say, it all work I, I, I out. I didn't say he and, and, he, and he's working and against, of course, uh, the uh, consequences of the Iraq war. And, yeah. and, and, right, oh, and Romney did make a gaffe. Romney yeah, yeah, right, did. Right, 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 and, right. It wasn't, and then not just a gaffe, he intruded himself yeah. into the middle of an he's ongoing for foreign president. policy crisis he's without knowing what he's doing, and, and then well, doubling down and contradicting himself. <laughs> Wait, 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 wait. Well, sorry. Uh, sorry. sorry, hang on. The, the, um, the, the the point was not that Obama promised peace and stability. He promised an entirely new anti-Bush approach to the Middle East. And the point is that we now have precisely the same anti-American demonic sort of demonstrations against the United right, States that we had before he made that initiative. Nobility. I agree entirely with you, Janet. I think at the heart of all these protests is the, uh, the, the role of the U.S. and indeed its foreign policy uh, uh, in relation with the Arab world and indeed the Muslim world. And the, the Arab Spring did an awful lot to perhaps strengthen those relationships, but it has to be said that there still remains an awful lot of suspicion and distrust as to the role of the U.S. And this is particularly the case when the Americans uh, routinely uses, uh, they use violence themselves uh, to uh, f further their own political ends, uh, drone attacks against alleged terrorists, and in the case of Libya, uh, the rendition pro can I program. Ask you, if this was an Al-Qaeda operation, then what is he to do now except use the drone attacks to try to take out Al Qaeda. What, what else can he do? I mean, he's caught in a, in a dilemma, really, because he has to appear to be firm and, you know, he can't uh, remain, uh, you know, he has to be extremely firm in the, you know, in the face yeah. of murder against U.S. Mm. officials, uh, especially but in what the is the year leading uh, to the election. What is the firmness of the system? What, what is the firmness of the system? You have, to attack, you have to do something. If, yes. if, if they felt that uh, we were stronger, they wouldn't have attacked. I, I, don't, well, I don't understand how you measure that, yeah. that strength. I think but, at the uh, crux uh, of it all is the hypocrisy when you had, you know, the, the U.S. administrations in general backing up and indeed propping up Arab dictators and indeed working hand in hand with Gaddafi to torture, you know, people on Libyan soil. So there's a uh, historical the, inheritance yeah. which is going to take a long time indeed. to get through indeed. and I don't think Obama but can Obama hasn't wave shown his wand and make that go away. of undoing that legacy and that's no, the problem. It's, which, well, he, I think he has he's certainly it's, a different legacy from George uh, W. Bush. I mean, a, a large <laughs> war in the Middle East. He made a beautiful speech in Cairo which inspired a lot of people but it stopped there. I want to bring in Sol one, one other thought, which is when, when uh, the president offered the opportunity to talk about Egypt as an ally, I didn't do it. I mean, how do you think that went down in Israel in particular? Uh, well, President Obama just said that Egypt is neither an ally nor, nor an enemy, and I think that it had no bearing on what the Israelis may have seen his uh, attitude towards the issue of the Middle East. In general, what they think is that he's, he's, he's too weak in terms of his attitude to the certain changes in the Middle East. He took a backseat over Libya. He doesn't do anything in the face of the massacre that takes place all the time in Syria. Uh, he comes across as somebody who did not assert or reassert his uh, control over what is happening in the so Middle East. So do you East. go a long way with Janet and, in, in, well, in her argument? It seems to me that we are sobering up to, from our illusion that what the recent events in the Arab world, the Arab Spring, uh, uh, would bring about a democracy. Democracy translates itself into uh, a chaos, and we start asking ourselves, are we in the process of 
missing uh, Gaddafi or Saddam Hussein? I personally miss Mubarak already. But so is it that <laughs> the know, Arab world has to be between the deep sea and the... And, and but you know, Jan Obama's not going the whole way of saying, talking about nation building. You know, this is the thing. I mean, he, he talks about a conciliatory attitude, which can be misread as appeasement, sorry, uh, as, as, as the Republicans are saying, but he's not going in for nation building, building dem democratic institutions, and he's leaving the Middle East in a high asset. A fine word in this, Jeff, and then uh, I want to move on. He, he can't even get the Israelis to do anything about settlements, let alone uh, the Arab Spring. I mean, there, there, is, there are limits. He can't make Syria a peaceful place. He can't invade. You have to recognize he's got to, to work with what he has. And the tone, the shift is in the long run, because these are big historical problems. I think the right one. Of course, not everything is going to be uh, peaches and cream in the meantime, but I don't really see what genuine alternative he well, has from the fundamental approach he's taking. Let's move on, because Obama comes up in uh, our next item, too, because the Prime Minister of Israel wants the United States to draw what he calls a red line over which Iran dare not cross. Benjamin Netanyahu says instead he has a red light from America, possibly preventing some kind of action. Now, not all Israelis agree with their political leader, but is Israel gearing up for a unilateral attack on a nation which could soon have a nuclear bomb? What, what, do, you, what do you make of what, what's going on here? Many people think that, that Netanyahu is embarking on uh, a rhetoric that would put uh, not only Israel in danger, but also the, its relationship with America. Some people ask, including the head of the opposition, are you forcing or are you asking for a regime change in Tehran or in Washington? <laughs> and, it seems, and it seems to me that, that uh, the Israeli prime minister is meddling in, into uh, the American um, election campaign by appointing himself so to speak, as, the, as Mitt Romney uh, campaign manager, simply because he comes across as somebody who explicitly shows interest in uh, supporting uh, Mitt Romney as the next uh, American president. Now, with regards to uh, the likelihood of an attack against Iran, he is very, very isolated in his tough attitude and his rhetoric towards Tehran, because most of the public opinion uh, in both countries are against an attack against Iran at that very moment. The American Defense Secretary said all the time that for us, imposing a red line would be impossible, and quite rightly so. For us, a red line is when the Iranians would acquire the bomb, not how many, uh, um, or what would be the, the quantity of the enriched uranium. And also, all former chief of staff, head of the Mossad, head of the equivalent of the MI5 in Israel, came up against any attack against uh, Iran at that very moment and without the assistance of the Americans. The present chief of staff is very, very shy about it. He doesn't m say anything ex explicitly, but everybody knows that he is opposing it. The Israeli president is very much against it. It seems to me that Netanyahu is playing the nuclear card in order to influence the outcome of the American elections no, because he President wants Romney. to see Mitt Romney right. in the White House. So, uh, how, how do you th think this is viewed in the neighboring Arab states of both countries? Because, uh, uh, well, as you, as you know, privately many Arab leaders uh, are extremely concerned by what one told me was the Persian bomb. Yes, but I, I think to uh, pick up on what you've just said, Saul, I think that the U.S. are not in any position at the moment to draw any red lines or indeed to, send in, to give any red lights to anyone uh, in the region at the moment, uh, given the extremely strong anti-American sentiment. And I think Israel hasn't been discussed, mu discussed much in the context of the Arab Spring, but it's very much part of the problem. And Saul, you exemplified that when you said you, you're missing uh, Hosni Mubarak already. I'm sorry, but that's what U.S. policy was all about in the Middle East propping up stable dictatorships to protect their own interest in the region and indeed the interest of the major ally which is Israel and that is part of the problem the moment you give you know democratic freedom to the populations not the dictatorships they tell you hang on a minute you know we have to be tough about the Israeli government if we ha manage to get rid of you know oppression then we want the Palestinians to also be able to get rid of the Israeli oppression yeah. I've, I've always thought, even pro-Zionist as I am, that it's a mistake for Israel and America to give the impression that they're standing in the way of democratic revolutions. That, that's like standing in the way of history. For people to embrace freedom is to embrace the modern world. You know, the idea of keeping people in the Middle Ages because it might be in your short-term interest is a mistake. Even if, with the messiness that we are now yes, uh, going to Yes, I mean, see, ultimately, democratic institutions and democratic freedoms have to be the answer mm -hmm. to these problems. And I don't think Israel should 
have put itself on the wrong side of that argument. But the trouble is that America has now, officially anyway, put itself on the right side of that argument, and it's still getting its ambassadors killed, which is a difficult problem for but America. I, I mean, the specific I issue of Iran, which uh, I'm sure the Obama administration hopes goes away until at least the middle of November, <laughs> perhaps forever. Forever. I mean, they, 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 <laughs> forever. But certainly until after the election, they don't really want to have to deal with, with, with Iran, and they don't want to have any problems with Israel right, right now, do they? Well, that, for the I reasons can, that Saul suggested. In a nightmare scenario, let's say, uh, yeah, I mean, the chairman of the Joint Chiefs said, if the Israelis attack, I don't want to be complicit in it. My gosh, for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs to get that political. But just imagine if uh, Israel starts an attack, by all accounts, it cannot really do the job. It doesn't have the fighters, the long-range tankers, the drones, all the material uh, necessary to really pull this off. It's going to take weeks. The uh, Iranians will attack back with rockets against Israel. Then comes a terrible moment for Obama. Do I intervene on the side of Israel or do I stand there and let our great ally be uh, pummeled by rocket attacks? Do I at least attack uh, Tehran enough for the uh, Iran enough to take out the rockets that are attacking Israel? This is a terrible uh, dilemma for him. He does not want a war in the Middle East. He does not want to antagonize the Iranians. In the long run, regime change in Tehran is the only real solution to this problem. It may not be the solution either. And that will be retarded by an attack that unites Iranians against but, the Americans. But regime Who, change, we've, we saw what happened to the attempt to change the regime of the grassroots yeah, movement no, in Iran. That fizzled yes, out yes, uh, and rather brutally was put down. Exactly, and I don't think that uh, the likelihood of a regime change is very near. Uh, in fact, I would say that, to be fair to, to the Israeli Prime Minister, I mean, he has uh, plenty of arguments to think about, simply because it is the Iranian government, since Ahmadinejad came to power, that keeps telling all the time that Israel should be eradicated. Only two weeks ago, Ahmadinejad, maybe for the 50th time, uh, delivered a speech in which he said that Israel is a cancerian growth. He's supported also by Ali Khamenei, the supreme leader of Iran, in but, that. But, but, so you, it is you accept Janet's point, though, that, uh, that it's, it's been wrong for Israel to say we're a democracy, but actually it's quite good for us to have authoritarian states on our borders because it keeps things quiet. In the well, long it's, term, it's a short, that's unsustainable. It's a short-term thinking. We all know about it. The Israelis failed to embrace the developments in the Arab world because they saw it as a threat against their existence in this uh, violent uh, neighborhood. And also because they see that uh, so many armed militias are operating not only in uh, Sudan or in Yemen or in Libya or in Afghanistan, but also in Gaza, in the Sinai Peninsula, so they feel quite uh, threatened about it. But yet, I think that we have to um, be worried about this rhetoric ad adopted by uh, the Israeli Prime Minister because he's trying to box Obama into the corner and by doing so also making the Iranians laughing all the way to the reactor. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, while, we're, while we're all still laughing about, about, uh, uh, about that and Obama's uh, problems, there is, has been some quite good news on the economy, hasn't there, this week, at least uh, in terms of the stock market. What of you think about quantitative easing or pumping more money in? And uh, some people have their doubts. The stock market's liked it. Uh, and uh, Germany, uh, the Supreme Court in Germany apparently said the rescue bid can go ahead. So perhaps things sit, will settle down for the next six or eight weeks at least. It, it looks and that, like that's what Obama needs, basically. I mean, the economic news, you know, is not dreadful. Uh, and uh, he's, he's uh, up in uh, the ten closest swing states. He's up by three or four points in eight of them. Um, it looks, I mean, Ohio and Pennsylvania are off the table, it looks like, for Romney. It seems very difficult now, actually, to see how Romney can put together the number of electoral votes he needs to get to the White House. Um, all of this Although the popular vote is still pretty much 50-50, isn't it? Right. Uh, the likely voters, anyway. six-point advantage for Obama. But, it's all, you know, the polls are all not reliable yeah. and things can happen. Um, the trend line seems to be good for Obama. The uh, Romney is just not making things happen his way. I think that what his intervention this week on the foreign policy was an attempt to sort of grab hold of the news and make something happen. Uh, but it's, it hasn't been happening. Well, what, and, yeah, and, the, and the polls are relatively stable. One, one thing I did notice this week, which, again, the polls are all over the place, but uh, it, this week was a week in which polling suggested, the Pew, I think it was, suggested that uh, actually Obama on the economy is slightly now more trusted than Romney, which is a, an interesting phenomenon, g given you know uh, how rocky the economy has been. The advantage is always with the incumbent in America. I mean, 
America is a conservative country with a small C. It always tends to re-elect the president uh, unless you know something really goes horribly wrong. Uh, but the, the, the interesting thing about this election is not, well, I mean, obviously it's interesting who wins, but the election campaign itself and the debate that goes on within it is tremendously important. The debate that the Republicans are trying to force on the economy about whether the entitlement society that has now grown up in America can actually be afforded, uh, whether the market can produce enough wealth to actually allow for the kind of redistributive economy that, he, that, that, that Obama seems to be establishing. That is a very, very serious argument, and it's one we ought to be having here. Uh, and maybe it'll become infectious. Maybe we will have it here as a consequence of the American presidential election. Okay, we've only got a few more minutes left, so I wanted to uh, ask whatever you might think of Prince Harry's escapade at a Las Vegas party. Most people probably think a young woman, a princess or otherwise, should be entitled to a degree of privacy on holiday with her husband. So does the publication of topless photographs of the woman who will one day presumably be queen simply show that privacy is dead? What do you think? Uh, I know you're, I'm you're, you're very excited by this story. In this. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> the, uh, my, my, I'm a rebellious colonial, so I'm sort of half-hearted <laughs> anti-monarchist anyway. But I mean, the idea that while well, the Middle East is blowing up and all the things we've been talking about have been going on, all the news headlines and all the news coverage has to be take the top story as this. I mean, it, see, it seems Ruritanian to me. But having said that... <laughs> this is the last is there, item in the program. Right, I just okay. want you to is there the anything, structure here is somewhat okay, different. Okay. Is there anything... Is there anything is there a serious possibility of having privacy in the modern world? If you're famous, mm. probably not. Right, uh, so get used to it, yeah, basically. I mean, if you're a royal, get used to it. I mean, um, uh, I mean Princess Diana, uh, yeah. Wellington Inquiry, it's not as if private, uh, privacy is instantly dead. It's been dying for s some considerable time. And I think the reason that we don't have any pictures of the Queen in any kind of compromising position is that for her entire life, she has both understood this and had the self-discipline to make sure no long-ranged uh, photograph right. will ever be that interesting. Uh, well, I, I, you don't speak for the entire French press, uh, or certainly not close to the magazine, but I, I, I mean, the thing that really strikes me is that the French press over the past 20 or 30 years have failed to uncover so much stuff about Dominique Strauss-Kahn, uh, President Mitch Chirac, Ryan. and I could give you an entire list, and yet they are boldly go and stick a camera over a wall and get a picture of a woman uh, uh, sunbathing topless. Well, absolutely, and that's a very fair point, but I think there's a distinction between sober uh, quality press in France uh, and indeed uh, uh, glossy uh, celebrity magazines like Closer. And uh, it's very true that politicians or uh, celebrities in general tend to take advantage of very strict privacy laws and the, uh, which are backed up by uh, not so serious punishments. And it's make, it makes it difficult for journalists to indeed write, you know, forcefully or expose people because, you know, you, you're running the risk. I'm talking when you're a serious publication of, uh, you know, ending up in court and it's not, not a pleasant uh, experience. But having said that, I think Closer Magazine clearly and unambiguously breached uh, uh, privacy laws in France. And uh, this matter will go in court. No doubt that the royal family will win their case. There's a diplomatic principle almost, imperative behind it all. But I think as Janet said, it's very, you know, you have to just live with it. And I think the view in France is that uh, they see the royal family not so much as part of the establishment. We don't have that reverential attitude towards them. We see them as celebrities, as stars almost, and, and, and therefore as fair game. And if the royal institution is to survive, uh, then there has to be a certain perhaps uh, uh, sense of decorum and uh, recourse to some etiquette uh, to I mean, to, 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 uh, to sustain the, fa the, the business uh, yeah. as it... It's, know, it's an irony that the, the French... Too small, too. Yeah. <laughs> the too it's an irony that the French who always took the higher moral gun and preaching the British, look at your newspapers, all these tabloids, you know. <laughs> but they are going through a process of tabloidization, the French themselves, really. And they really are not in the position of preaching to the British. But I can detect hypocrisy on both sides of the channel. The British I'm cannot shocked that you can... <laughs> I'm so shocked that you can do that. The British invented, you know, <laughs> Tabloid journalism. And when you compare the two scandals with Harry and Kate Middleton, I'm saying that now nobody is really 
thinking about Harry as the naked prince because he is on an Apache in Afghanistan. So it could be that the solution is to dispatch Kate Middleton on an Apache to Libya. <laughs> and everybody will forget every, her bikini. Every, every, forget the bikini. There, there is, I'm going to attempt to rescue this and make a serious point here, which is the background to all this, of course, is the Leveson inquiry. And there are those, including former uh, head of the Press Complaints Commission here, who said this actually proves that the British system is actually better than the French system because the French system is supposed to be uh, mm. a, a legal statutory obligation to do certain things. It doesn't work. Yeah. And in Britain, no, no. no newspaper, I suspect, will publish this. No, and privacy laws are, in, are invidious. I mean, freedom of speech has to be indivisible. <laughs> and the idea of a privacy law would mean that every powerful, rich person in Britain could buy him privacy and, uh, and other poor devils who can't afford to go to court could not. That's the long and short of it. But so uh, so in, the, in that context, if Levison goes for, for that kind of thing, all the press and all journalists in this country will be pretty much united against that kind of I idea. I would have thought so. I would hope so. Okay. I understand also that Berlusconi's family owns the magazine in France and the one that is going to publish it on Monday in Italy. <laughs> exactly. So can't we pick up the phone to Berlusconi and tell him, please? Okay. I think whatever your views on the case, a fascinating development is that there's a clear attempt by the palace to control foreign media. Indeed. Yeah. All right. That's it for Daily yeah. London for this week. We're back next week at the same time. You can keep up to date with the program by following on Twitter at Gavin Esther. Goodbye.